So this brings us to a kind of related section. So we just looked at taxation. Well, now let's talk about government expenditure in this model. Um, and this is kind of just, I'm going to come back to something we talked about in the early lectures, which is why are these models useful? Well, one thing we like to do with our models is change some exogenous variable. So that is a variable determined outside of the model and see how it changes endogenous variables. So that is those variables determined within the model. Okay, so in our case, what are the exogenous variables? They're G, government expenditure, right? We're just accepting that as given, that the government is spending some amount of money and we, you know, it's not being affected by anything in the model. Likewise, Z, you know, the technology rate, this isn't affected by anything in the model. It's not changing in the model. And K, K is fixed, right? It's not being changed at any point in the model. What are the endogenous variables? Well, these are things that again, are being affected or being determined by the model. The things that are being, you know, given the exogenous variables, they're what we're solving for. So that's consumption, leisure, labor supply, labor demand, taxes, which, I mean, taxes are just being determined simply by G is equal to T, but anyways, we treat them as endogenous. Output Y and uh, the wage, W. And so what we're going to do here in this section is we're going to increase G, we're going to increase government expenditure, and then we're going to look at what the effects are. So why is this important? You know, why is this something we might want to do? Well, governments do, you know, spend, and often they'll change their levels of expenditure. And so, you know, just in general, it might be nice to understand what macroeconomic impacts this has. You know, this is just part of understanding how the economy works and what leads to changes and what. But maybe kind of more importantly is that government expenditure is often used as a macroeconomic stabilization tool. So for example, you'll hear people refer to stimulus spending. Okay, so we'll talk about this more in the next slide, but you can think about in the Great Recession, a lot of governments increased their level of expenditure and they did it purposely to have impacts on the macroeconomy, to sort of help to alleviate the effects of the recession. And so looking at this through the lens of a model, we can kind of look at, well, what do we expect those effects to be? Okay, so let's talk about stimulus for a second. I'm gonna start by talking about the Keynesian view. And this is not the view we're gonna see in the model. But the reason I wanna talk about it is it's kind of the view I think that most governments hold. Okay, so when you hear governments or news talk about stimulus, this is the view they're thinking of. And maybe this is the view you know yourself from hearing these people talk. And so I'll give you an example, which is following the Great Recession, okay, there's this collapse in the housing market and suddenly a lot of construction workers are laid off. Well, the Keynesian view is one thing we could do is the government could spend on infrastructure projects and in that way it could start to employ more of these workers again, right? If I buy a bridge, well then the makers of that bridge need to employ construction workers and so some of those construction workers who were laid off before now have jobs once more. So let's kind of think through the logic of this model that I just described. Okay, so first of all, there are unemployed resources in this view, right? So maybe following a recession or maybe not even in a recession, we might say there are some workers, for example, who are unemployed. And the reason they're unemployed is because there isn't enough demand for what they're producing. So in the case of the Great Recession, the idea is there wasn't enough demand for construction projects because suddenly, there was no demand for housing construction. So the government can increase its expenditure, which then leads to an increase in demand or aggregate demand, we call it demand for everything. But if you want to think specifically, you could think increases its demand for those projects which require construction workers. This increase in demand for goods and services leads to an increase in demand for labor. Right? So buying a bridge leads to an increase in demand for workers who build that bridge. 
And that increase in demand for labor leads to an increase in employment, right? The bridge company or the company who's building the bridge then employs workers. That's the Keynesian view. And as I said, this is also the view I think held by most governments and also by, say, the media. What about the new classical view? And that's the view of our model. And we're going to see that actually it's different in many ways than this. So let's look at it graphically through the lens of our model. And remember that what we're going to work with is the social planners problem. And the reason we're going to do that is, again, we don't have to worry about mm, the budget constraint, basically. We don't have to worry about, for example, prices. All we have to worry about is those two curves now. Okay, so what does this look like? So imagine the government is initially spending G0, which means that the production possibilities frontier looks something like this. Here we have leisure and consumption. And imagine that the consumer is initially consuming right here. Okay. Now G increases. So suddenly the government is going to spend more. We'll call it G1. What does that do? Well, it shifts the entire production possibility frontier down by the difference between G1 and G0. Okay. So now suddenly this production possibilities frontier is going to look like this. It's now shifted down at every point. And now what's the consumer going to pick? Well, I claim, and I'll tell you why, that the consumer will now pick a point like this. Okay, and so the result is, I'll do it in red, that both consumption, okay, so here's C0 is going to go down to C1. So consumption falls. This is an ugly color combination. And likewise, leisure falls. Why is that? Well, this increase in G is equivalent to a negative income effect, right? There's no change in relative prices. What has happened is that for any point, any choice of leisure, for example, I can now have some amount less of consumption. It's the equivalent of a negative income effect, or as we saw in the theory of the consumer, it's really the same as increasing taxes, right? If we move from T0 to T1, and incidentally, that's exactly what's happening here, that's a negative income effect. And because it's a negative income effect, that means that because consumption and leisure are both normal goods, they fall, okay? So consumption goes down because it's a normal good. Labor supply goes up, right? Leisure goes down, and that means labor supply goes up. Again, this is because leisure is a normal good. What happens to Y, to output? Well, it has to go up, right? Why does it go up? Because remember, Y is just equal to Z times F, K, N and n goes up, we just saw it, and so that implies that output must go up, y must go up. And then finally, one thing we might want to look at is this ratio here. This is the change in y over the change in government expenditure. This is also known as the multiplier. What the multiplier says is if the government increases its expenditure, how much proportionally does it increase output. Now early Keynesian said that the multiplier should be greater than one. That is that for every dollar that the government increases its expenditure, total output goes up by more than a dollar. Kind of more recently, there's been, I suppose people have realized that this definitely depends on the situation the economy is in and the multiplier might fluctuate quite a bit and undoubtedly in many cases is below one. Now what is it in this case? Well, let's see here. So this is the change in Y over the change in G. What's the change in Y? Well, Y is just equal to C plus G. So that means that it's the change in C plus the change in G all over the change in G. 
okay? Now, C is going down, G is going up, and so that means that the change in C is negative, okay? So change in G plus change in C is going to be less than the change in G. Why is that? Because change in G is positive, change in C is negative, so when you add the two together, you get something less than the change in G. So that implies that, in fact, maybe I should write it like that here, let me see. I should say this is negative and this is positive. There we go. And so that implies that this is going to be less than one. Why? Because the numerator is less than the denominator. And therefore, change in y over change in g is less than one, or put another way, the multiplier is less than one, or finally put one more way, if the government increases expenditure by one dollar, output increases by less than one dollar. Okay, now so right away we can see a few things. In some sense, this is similar to our Keynesian stimulus view, right? Output has gone up. The government increased its expenditure and this resulted in higher output. And also it led to higher hours worked, higher employment. And those are two of the conclusions that the Keynesian stimulus view also had. But on this next slide, I'm gonna tell you that actually they're very different. So in what ways are the two stories very different? Well, let's start with this first one. First of all, in the Keynesian view, there was unemployed labor. And in the new classical view, there's no unemployed labor, right? There's a consumer who's choosing how much hours to supply rationally. In the Keynesian view, there are people who'd like to be working but aren't. And so that in itself has some kind of major implications here. So moving on to the next point, in the Keynesian story, there's more employment because of this increase in demand for workers, right? There's some people who are unemployed and the government can create the demand necessary for their employment by spending. But this is very different from the new classical view. The new classical view is the following, that there's more employment, yes, but the reason is different. It's because taxes are going up, so people feel, feel poorer, right? That's this negative income effect we're talking about. And because they feel poor, they sacrifice leisure and work more, right? This is a very different story. Very different because in the Keynesian case, it's in fact the opposite, right? The reason people are working more, which is leading them to feel wealthier. There's some people who are unemployed who are now being employed. And as a result, those people feel wealthier. In the new classical story, the reason people are working more is because they feel poorer, and to make up for that, they say, well, I better work more. And finally, the Keynesian story says there's an increase in consumption. Why? Because unemployed workers before were consuming less because they didn't have the income to consume. When I employ them, now they have more income. And because they have more income, they consume more. In the new classical story, you have the opposite, right? Our workers feel poorer because they've had this negative income effect. And so as a result, they consume less. So these are two very different stories. And in some sense, I leave it up to you to kind of think about which one seems more credible. I mean, a lot of the time when we're comparing these different theories, you do what some economists call the sniff test, you know, which is which one really sounds more credible. And maybe I'll, you know, I don't want to give away maybe my own views, but in saying what I'm about to say, maybe I will, which is that think about the new classical story in the case of the Great Recession. Was it that government spent more and then construction workers started working more because they said, uh-oh, my taxes are going to go up, I better work more? Or was it that suddenly there were more jobs available from them because now there were all these infrastructure projects? Here are some other questions we might have. One, what if the government borrows rather than taxing? And 
Actually, this is something you'll see later. Now, the new classical view is that it doesn't have, it doesn't make a difference, but you can imagine that perhaps it does. And this isn't something I'll go into, but something to think about. Two, what if government expenditures are redistributive? Okay, so here's my example. Imagine taxes are mainly paid by one group, one group who consumes little of their income. So for example, rich people often consume a smaller share of their income than do poor people. So if taxes are mainly paid by, say, rich people over poor people, then this affects the total amount of consumption in the economy. So I continue here. Imagine then that government expenditures benefit another group who consumes a lot of their income. Then the overall effect might be an increase in consumption. So let me go through this one more time. Imagine I'm taxing people who don't consume a lot, say rich people, and the effects of my government expenditure are to, say, employ people who consume a lot of their income, let's say poorer construction workers. Well, then the people who are being taxed, the rich, sure, they might decrease their consumption. But it's possible that those people who are now gaining from it, say unemployed poor construction workers, are consuming proportionally more than the rich are reducing their consumption because of the increase in taxes. And so it's possible that the overall effect on consumption actually may be positive rather than negative, which is what the model finds. And once again, I make the point I said before, which is how come we don't have government expenditure in the utility function, right? If we go back, what does it look like is happening to utility when the government increases the expenditure? It looks like utility is going down, right? But like I said before, it's highly possible that this government expenditure is yielding utility to consumers, which is greater than the loss in utility from lost consumption and lost leisure. And I put here, this is my sort of final point on this, that, you know, you've maybe noticed that so far in this new classical literature, there's kind of this anti-government bias, pro-free market anti-government. And a lot of this could be related to the political preferences of early new classical economists. So new classical economics started sort of during this Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan era of, uh, you know, conservatism and anti-government and pro-free market and economics at the time kind of reflected that. And so new classical economics in particular reflected that. <clears throat> and a lot of its early proponents had these views. And so perhaps in that sense, it's not surprising that some of these kind of anti-government views fall out of these models.